so I thought it might be appropriate to try and read this bit on the ferry. It's quite noisy though, but we'll give it a go. This is, uh, we're on a new chapter finally, chapter um, 16. The lad with the silver button, that's me, well I've got the shell. And we're going from Mull to Morven. There is a regular ferry from Torosay to Kinlochalai on the mainland. Both shores of the Sound are in the country of the strong clan of the Maclean's, and the people that passed the ferry with me were almost all of that clan. The skipper of the boat was called Neil Roy Macrob, and since Macrob was one of the names of Alan's clansmen, and Alan himself had sent me to that ferry, I was eager to come to private speech with Neil Roy. In the crowded boat this was of course impossible, and the passage was a very slow affair. There was no wind, and as the boat was wretchedly equipped, we could pull but two oars on one side and one on the other. The men gave way, however, with a good will, the passengers taking spells to help them, and the whole company giving the time in Gaelic boat songs. And what with the songs, and the sea air, and the good nature, and the spirit of all concern, and the bright weather, the passage was a pretty thing to have seen. But there was one melancholy part. In the mouth of Loch Aline, we found a great sea-going ship at anchor, and this I suppose to be at first, to be one of the king's cruisers, which were kept along that coast both summer and winter to prevent communication with the French. As we got a little nearer, it became plain she was a ship, ship of merchandise, and what still puzzled me more, not only her decks, but the sea beach also were quite black with people, and skiffs were continually plying to and fro between them. Yet nearer, and there began to become to our ears a great sound of mourning. The people on board and those on the shore crying and lamenting one to another so as to pierce the heart. Then I understood this was an emigrant ship bound for the American colonies. We put the ferry boat alongside and the exiles leaned over the bulwarks, weeping and reaching out their hands to my fellow passengers, among whom they counted some near friends. How long this might have gone on I do not know, for they seemed to have no sense of time, but at last the captain of the ship, who seemed near beside himself, in, and no great wonder, in the midst of this crying and confusion came to the side and begged us to depart. Thereupon Neil sheered off, and the chief singer in our boat struck into a melancholy air which was presently taken up both by the emigrants and their friends upon the beach, so that it sounded from all sides like a lament for the dying. I saw the tears run down the cheeks of the men and women in the boat, even as they bent at the oars, and the circumstances and the music of the song, which is one called Loch Arbor No More, were highly affecting, even to myself. At King Lochaline I got Neil Roy upon one side on the beach and said I made sure he was one of Appin's men. And what for no? said he. I'm seeking somebody, said I, and it comes in my mind that you will have news of him. Alan Breck Stewart is his name, and very foolishly, instead of showing him the button, I sought to pass a shilling in his hand. At this he drew back. I am very much affronted, he said, and this is not the way that one gentleman should behave to another at all. The man you ask for is in France, but if he was in my sporran, says he, and your belly full of shillings, I wouldn't hurt a hair upon his body. I saw I had gone the wrong way to work, and without wasting time upon apologies, I showed him the button lying in the hollow of my palm. Well, well, said he. I think you might have begun with that end of the stick or whatever. But if you are the lad with the silver button, all is well. I have the word to see that she comes safe, and if you'll pardon me to speak plainly, says he, there is a name you should never take into your mouth, and that is the name of Alan Breck. And there is a thing that you should never do, and that is to offer your dirty money to a Highland gentleman. It was not very easy to apologise, for I could scarce tell him, what was the truth, that I had never dreamed he would set up to be a gentleman until he told me so. Neil, on his part, had no wish to prolong his dealings with me, only to fulfil his orders and be done with it, and he made haste to give me my route. This was to lie the night in Kinlochaline in the public inn, to cross Morven the next day to Ardgore, and lie the night in the house of one John of the Claymore, who was warned that I might come. The third day to be set across one lock at Corran and another at Balakulish, and then ask my way to the house of James of the Glens at Ocarn in Jura of Appin. There was a good deal of ferrying, ferrying as you hear, 
The sea in all this part running deep into the mountains and winding about their roots. It makes the country strong to hold and difficult to travel, but full of prodigious wild and dreadful prospects. I had some other advice from Neil, to speak with no one by the way, to avoid wigs, camels and the red soldiers, to leave the road and lie in a bush if I saw any of the latter coming, for it was never chancy to meet in with them, and in brief, to conduct myself like a robber or a Jacobite agent as perhaps Neil thought of me. Now the inn at Kinlochaline was the most beggarly vile place that ever pigs were styed in, full of smoke, vermin and silent highlanders. Now that is something we've got to see. I had not been half an hour at the inn, standing in the door most of the time to ease my eyes from the peat smoke, when a thunderstorm came close by, the springs broke in a little hill on which the inn stood, and one end of the house became a running water. Places of public entertainment were bad enough all over Scotland in those days. Yet it was a wonder to myself when I had to go from the fireside to the bed in which I slept, wading over the shoes. So that's it for the uh, 4th of July. We're about halfway across our crossing, onto the mainland, where I guess it will be less wild, but maybe uh, not quite as primitivo. So that's the end of the reading for the uh, 4th of July. Farewell then to Mull. A lovely place, a bit rough around the edges, but full of beautiful landscapes, full of sunshine and rain. So farewell then to Mull. A beautiful place of sunshine and rain. We started to get a bit more adventure now that we keep meeting characters and there are more characters to come. Each day now we're going to bump into more and more people and there's going to be more and more action. In fact there's going to be more and more to read so squishing it into one whole day is going to be quite tricky as we come up to some of the key events. I may have to update you in sections during some days because there's so much going on. For tomorrow, it's really just a walk across Morven with a guy who's addicted to snuff. Uh, do you know anyone who's addicted to snuff? Uh, I don't know if anybody's really taken snuff, have they, recently? Is there a snuff appreciation society out there? Okay, that's enough snuff.